Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Dan McQuillan is here. He never disappoints. Today, he's going to disappear the technology, disappear the complexity. It's all coming up with the Bionic Table on Twert. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio, audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week at Radio Tech, the show where we're talking about everything from uh, the microphone to the light bulb there at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a gorgeous day here in Nashville. It's absolutely beautiful. I wish I was doing the show outside, but here I am stuck inside. But it's not such a bad stuck. Uh, We're going to have a really interesting show today. I've been looking forward to this, and today's the day that we get to do it. We have to talk about some amazing, amazing uh, technology. So, um, gee, without much further ado, let's go ahead and bring our guest, and it's Dan McQuillan. Dan, hi, you've been on the show before. Welcome back. Yeah, I think a year since I was uh, last on the show, and uh, didn't expect we'd still be kind of locked down and not had uh, NAB mm-hmm. yet this year either, but it's, it's great to be able to share some of the stuff that we would be sharing in Vegas right now uh, and uh, yeah, give you an update on what we've been doing this last year and what we might be doing next. <laughs> well, you've got some technology to show us that, um, well, as the title of the show suggests, is called Bionic Table, Bionic Table. And we're going to get to that in, in just a minute. Hey, first, I, I want to mention that a lot of our show ideas come from our friends at um, Radio Guide, Radio Guide Magazine. It's uh, on the web at radio-guide.com. And one of the cool things about Ray Top and his publication, Radio Guide, is that his articles are, are lengthy. You can go into some detail. So if you really want to take a, a good deep dive into a topic, look for an article in Radio Guide. So you can go to the website, radio-guide.com or hey you can sign up for the uh, home delivery of the paper it comes out every two months and uh, it's really a it's a great publication and i'm proud to be associated with ray top and radio guide some of the best engineers in the country uh, in the u.s are writing articles for radio guide and again like i said they're more in depth and we're going to go in depth with uh, this particular topic about bionic table so dan um Last time that, well, last time you and I produced a video, uh, you talked quite a bit about a concept that you called cushions and daylight. And I don't know if that was your idea or if that actually came out of the mouth of somebody who you interviewed. But what what I've mentioned it on this show, and we've we've uh, played the video. Uh, my employer, uh, Telus Alliance, uh, put this video on their YouTube channel. What what's cushions and daylight, and what is how does that relate to? modern radio studios and and then bring us into what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so today I hope we'll have a conversation which is largely about technology, but is also about philosophy, about design, and about how we produce and consume content uh, in the modern world. And so, yeah, probably it was about five or six years ago now, uh, out of some research that we'd done, we did a big virtualization project for the BBC that we talked about before with you guys uh, uh, Vylor. And then after that, we wanted to look at their core kind of flagship marquee radio studios and, and looking at what, what is the best that a radio studio can be in particular in order to generate all of the different content for the purposes and platforms that, that radio is consumed through today. So intelligent metadata, transcription, video, social, all the stuff that, that Broadcast Bionics and Bionics Studio are, are probably best known for. And so the BBC started a project which they called Internet Fit Radio, which was which their idea of, you know, we have this lovely thing. And, and I have to say right up front, I love radio. I love the business of radio. I love the, the craft of radio. I love the storytelling of radio. So everything we talk about today is not really technology and abstract. It's about saying, how do we take the best of the last 90 years of radio and fit it for the next 10, 20, 30 years given what we know about how audiences want to consume it, the platforms that we now have available to us. And the BBC called that concept Internet Fit Radio, taking the beloved content and and, uh, format of radio, but really equipping it for this next generation. And so we talked at the time 
about some of the technology design and studio design, but it, it came out of some research done as they went to, to talent and producers and presenters of saying, what did they want from the physical studio spaces uh, as we added more technology and, and did all these clever sort of interactive things? And it was kind of a throwaway comment uh, in the research that when the technologists came back with all of this research from these content and creative kind of people at the other opposite end of our business sometimes, uh, they didn't ask for digital consoles, they didn't ask for audio over IP, they didn't ask for all the things that, that we love and, and think of as the future, they asked for cushions and they asked for daylight. And I said, right, I am going to make it my mission uh, to make that our mantra, because I thought as a technologist, that was really interesting, that it was, it was not about how you made the radio, uh, you know, how, how you produce the audio, that the talent really thought would make the biggest difference, but how you inhabit the space, how the space feels, how the space is presented to the audience, and how the space is interacted with by you as the talent and the guests that come in. And if you think about the clinical, technical nature of, of, of the spaces that we've created, I think we're sometimes creating a barrier from the technology uh, and we're not really understanding that now the technology can begin to fade into the background and, and not be so dominant. Uh, and so we can create spaces which are much more uh, pleasing and creative to look at as we visualize content, but also may actually get a completely different performance from talent uh, and engagement and reaction from, from irregular you know, guests and users we have coming in the studio who are often intimidated or uncomfortable in, in complicated austere, technocratic kind of looking spaces. So I'm a technologist, I design software and, and you know, we as a company build software and work very closely with Telos and others on, on hardware. Uh, we still help people to build big, complicated, monolithic radio studios. But the whole way we think about the, the next generation of design and things really has been informed over that last five years by this idea of, yeah, don't think about more technology, think about how you can apply better technology and smarter technology such that all the capability is, is uh, uplifted, but you know, the, the technology ideally disappears, becomes natural, becomes an extension of the talent, the creativity, the space. Um, and so that was a, a mantra for a while from us, and we've seen some interesting uh, you know, use of, of lighting and furniture and, and, you know, and cushions and daylight. We made some cushions. Um, I should have, should have, yeah, we've got some just over there that say, my studio is smarter than yours. So if, if, we should have a cushion giveaway at the end of this. But um, yeah, we, we, uh, it's, it's 10 o'clock at night here, so we don't have any daylight, but we do, we do have cushions and daylight in the building. But, you know, I guess I want, even though this is a technical audience, for people to consider the, the implications of how we design and inhabit spaces on the content we create and the opportunity that we have to use technology, um, you know, at the time we were saying, you know, our radio studios still look like a little bit like a NAF 1980s hi-fi. Uh, they don't look like an iPad or an iPhone. And, you know, I think that's a missed opportunity to be smarter about the way we use technology. And as we get not just younger audiences, but younger talent and different, as we'll talk today, different uh, types of talent coming in from politicians and sports people and stand-up comedians who now want to come in and tell stories and, and make yeah. audio content, be that podcast or radio, then should we still be designing these very, very complex, very, very specialist spaces? Or can we learn from other industries who've been able to democratize access to the way stories are told and, and the way that technology is used and open up opportunities for a greater plurality of voices to inhabit spaces? So, yeah, it, you know, I cannot claim um, credit actually for the, the expression "cushions and daylight" uh, has come out of my mouth a lot. But it was originally written on many, many scraps of paper by BBC producers and presenters responding to, you know, what what did, what did they want from their future studio spaces? Um, and at the time, the the engineers went back and asked them, you know, okay, that's a bit embarrassing because we're the technologists. So, so what do you want? You know, that's what you want from the space, you know, and, and you, know, you can get some My Studios smarter than yours cushions, but what do you actually want from the technology? And, and they just said, uh, it just needs to work. It needs to be reliable, um, uh, you know, but, but how it works is, is really still entirely, hopefully, magical.
Dan, after our first commercial break, we're going to uh, get a demo of this and a complete explanation of, of what you're talking about. But what's a little bit interesting, and I want to make clear right off the bat, you're holding a, a, an, an iPad in, in your hand there on, on your lap, and that's not where the technology is. You haven't gotten rid of the technology. You co- you've made it kind of disappear so that the people using the room don't have to clutter their mind with faders and, and knobs and, and, and mix buses and mix minuses and things like that. It looks like you've just, well, I think you, you take a word that I consider um, uh, maybe uh, a, a noun and you make it a verb, you've disappeared the complexity. <laughs> yeah, and it's about the complexity. It is also one of the philosophies is bring your own device. So, you know, it, we'll, we'll talk about the meaning of table. The table is just that, it is just a table. Well, tell you what, let's go ahead and take our commercial break, which we were about to do anyway. And we'll get Dan uh, reconnected. We've got a video to run. It happens to be from Broadcast Bionics, our, our sponsor, about some different technology. And we'll be right back in two minutes. Hi, I'm Phil from Broadcast Bionics in the UK. And we've been helping broadcasters and podcasters to work remotely for some time. But in 2020, this has become more of a necessity for many. X Screen, Bionic Studio, and our other products can be fully functional via the internet on a VPN connection or RDP session. If you have any type of Telos VX, HX6, or IQ6, you may already be using the free edition of X Screen 2, giving you a software interface to go alongside your VSET controller. The subscription edition not only adds a cloud database and unrestricted workstation licenses, but also allows the user to call screen using a USB headset. Bionic Talk Show, part of the Bionic Studio, also allows this. Up until now, it's mainly been used for remote broadcasts, but now more and more stations have call screeners and producers working from home or socially distanced offices. The teams can still collaborate, communicate and deliver programming with the help of our tools. Many routers will have a VPN option. Your local IT specialist can help with this. Using a VPN, our workstation client software can be run on a home PC or laptop as if it was running on a machine at the studio. With remote desktop, the software still runs on a PC at the station. Simple port forwarding on your router may be all that's required to then control that PC and deliver the headset audio from another device using RDP, which is available as part of Windows. For technical help, our support team are on hand. You can email them on support at bionics.co.uk. Combine with our Anywhere and Skype TX for radio products, broadcast quality audio can be delivered from contributors around the corner or around the globe. They can even instant message with the shared chat windows and see the now playing information from within the Anywhere remote web interface. For more information, go to bionic.radio. We're helping broadcasters around the world to adapt to the new normal with innovative tools from Broadcast Bionics. So uh, Dan may have lost power. He alluded to that in the first part of the show that uh, his Internet's been terribly reliable, but uh, power not so much. Uh, Dan's office is in a beautiful countryside setting in um, in uh, England, and I've been there and it's really nice. So uh, we'll I'm going to wait for word from Suncast to see if uh, if Dan gets uh, Oh, he's back? Okay, super duper. All right, Dan, glad to have you back. Yeah, it proves it's live and it proves I really am like 4,000 miles away. Um, (laughs) So, uh, yeah, so we were kind of, let's start with the really simple end of this, which is the physicality of it, which is, uh, Mm -hmm. so uh, that internet fit radio project was looking at how we could build these more complex, more traditional studio spaces, and and which the BBC have several hundred. uh, but having looked at what these flagship, really large, complex spaces could be, they started the opposite end of that thought experiment, which is how simple could those spaces be? Because actually, they're being asked to, to, to use studio spaces increasingly for quite simple productions, for, for interviews and for podcasts, etc. So they need more and more studio spaces, but not necessarily more and more sophisticated spaces. And, and you know, the idea of flexible production spaces and pop-up and, and agile production spaces was, was really kind of uh, at the center of their thinking. So they came up with, after Cushions and Daylight, this idea of, okay, what would the simplest possible um, studio be? And here's an interesting thought experiment. You know, what do you, what, if you take things away one by one from a studio, at some point it's no longer a studio. So what's the last things that you can take away that, that really define the minimum possible viable concept of a studio? And, and they left us really just with three things, which was four microphones, four headphones and a table. 
And they said, you know, pretty well every studio or every production space needs a microphone to tell the story into, headphones to hear what's going on, and a table to put your stuff on and to tell the studio to tell the story around. Which I thought was kind of interesting that they they kept the table. Um, uh, you know, actually physically part of it. Actually, when I last told this story a year ago to, to you and, and young Chris, Chris didn't even have a table, so we were going to try and get him one. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so he'd, he'd gone one simpler, but really, you know, we could have just four microphones, four headphones, a table, and, and mm-hmm. could we not deliver everything that those really big, really technical spaces do um, with that degree of simplicity? And they came up with a, a kind of code name for this internally within the project of describing that simplest common unit of a, of a digital table of, hey, let's make the table magic so that all we have is this simple physicality of a, of a surface to tell the story around and put your stuff on. Four mics and four headphones, which are really the, you have to, the audio has to go in somewhere and it has to come out somewhere. Um, and there's a couple of interesting things about that design philosophy. First of all, there are no computers in this room. So, um, you know, I'm sat next to a bog standard table. This one was made for NAB, um, so it's somewhat specialized um, in that it has some cable management inside it. uh, And the only other element which we had to add to turn the philosophical idea of a digital table into a product, which is bionic table, was to add, in this case, an Axia X node, a microphone node in the side, because we have to connect these microphones and headphones to something. So this is a PoE device, so there is one network cable from the bionic or digital table to the real world. But otherwise, crucially, there is nothing else in this space. So when I walk away from here with my iPad and I turn the lights out and I go home, there is, there's not a computer in here. Average BBC Studio probably has about a dozen physical computers running 24-7, 365, service yeah. packs, updates, you know, uh, upgrades, maintenance, etc. There is nothing in here. This is just that construct of a physical table, a small powered edge device over a PoE, four microphones and four headphones. And when I walk away with my device that I bought in, there's nothing left. So the physical simplicity is really important to the idea because it means I can move this to the sixth floor or down to the second floor or to the other corner of the office in two minutes flat. There's just one wire between the table and, and the wall. Um, and the table itself is, is not special. You could have a round table, a square table, a high table, a low table. Um, but there are no computers that, that run here with it. And as you said, this is my iPad. And so I'm going to bring my iPad onto the screen now so you can see what, what I can see as we talk through. But this is just a browser. So this is just a web browser which is talking to the, the virtual servers that are sitting underneath in the data center below where I'm sitting. So the, you know, there, there is a virtual machine uh, that's part of this concept. So there's a couple of concepts that, that, that run alongside table. One, simplest possible footprint in the space. The only thing you have is a microphone to talk into and headphones to hear what's happening. Simplest possible space. All you have is a physical table to put your stuff on and a small edge device. No computers here. Second of all, everything that delivers the magic that runs behind this is entirely software and entirely virtual. So other than this box here, there is no other hardware. Now, not quite true, right? There is a there is a 32 core server downstairs running it, but it's a generic Dell server, and everything is entirely rendered locally in software and in Azure up in the cloud. So simplest possible edge device, simple simplest possible physical fabric and space that we can put in, and then the simplest possible device that you can bring, which is you know I mean you're doing it today on a Chromebook and a Mac, and I'm doing it on an iPad here. Bring your own device. And the table then has a URL that you navigate to, and then your device brings up the, the interface, uh, which is uh, hosted, in, in this case, up in the cloud. And it's talking to these resources, which are sitting underneath me. So uh, if you like, I'll take, take you and, and the Twerk audience through some of the things that this magical table can do. And then, because you're a geeky crowd, we'll actually unpick how the hell did that just all work? And, and talk a little bit more about what's really happening because it's not just a table. And, and if you are a tech savvy crowd thinking, did he just get rid of all the engineers in radio stations? Not at all. We got rid of the no. technology, but there is still a lot of technology here. Uh, you just don't see quite where it is and, and how it scales and how it operates. So we've, we've masked it from the user, but it actually provides quite a lot of benefits to the, to the engineer as well. Uh, in how you can manage it and support it locally and remotely. 
So what I have in front of me here on my iPad is being relayed to the screen in the, in the giant iPad next to me. Um, and that is kind of what this user interface looks like for the table. Okay, It doesn't look like a mixing console. It doesn't really look uh, anything like a radio product at the moment at all. Um, and we deliberately tried to shape some new metaphors and some new methodologies to, to challenge the way that we think about uh, the space into the workflow of what is the person walking up to the table trying to do? Not how does it do it or how have you always done it, but what do they want to do and how would they think about doing it and match that workflow? The idea again being that non-specialist users who aren't familiar with broadcast terminology or broadcast equipment could sit down and operate this just playfully in a few seconds. And earlier today we gave Kirk access to this and he's already just gone on and been operating the table uh, you know, and, and figured his way through it. Now, you're not the average user for this for sure. You, you know your way around a broadcast studio, but it's pleasing for us that the people we show this to just start playing with it because it's very tactile and kind of touchable. So nothing on the table, but this is the remote control you get um, uh, you know, when, you, when you go to the table. And we did get a little bit excited about table-based metaphors, which may or may not survive this going into sort of the mass market. But if you think of this table being the storytelling space, then every good table should have a menu of things, that are, of the buffet that you may wish to consume sat at the table. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit on that, you should see that I have at the top left a, a menu of resources that I can just drag and drop onto the table. So mm. at the bottom of the screen, we can see that I have um, so, some spaces that I can, that, that are the positions at the table that I can drop those menu items onto. And here was another one of our table-based metaphors and thought experiments. As you drop something onto the table, so I'm going to take mic one, which is me, and simply drag it and drop it into that first position. Then that first position, think of it as a fader channel. There, there really is a, a mixer virtualized and, and running underneath me here. The IQS from, from Telos is acting as a mixer. Oh, okay. But I don't have to think of that as needing a channel or a back feed or a hybrid. I'm just saying, right, I'm dragging this microphone, uh, and everything is now kind of wired up for me from, from that kind of underneath. Uh, but when I drop anything from the menu onto the table, uh, then we create what we call a utensil. So those slots down the bottom don't have any buttons or controls or look and feel until something is dropped onto them. And this is one of our ideas for the table is currently the entire way we, we intermediate with uh, audio and video resources in, in radio and TV is pretty well always through a fader or some sort of physical device, which is identical. You know, a fader on a mixing console is the same, whether it's a microphone or a back feed or, or, or a source or a, uh, a, a telephone or something. That seems counterintuitive. So in this space, we created utensils because when you eat at a table, you don't eat your soup with a fork. You don't, you know, you don't use right. a knife, uh, you know, to, to eat certain kinds of food. So we thought, why not create specialist utensils, which actually just uh, give you the right information and the right control for each different type of, of media or audio that you're operating. So I've dropped a microphone on. I have the ability to preview that. Uh, there's a talk back key so that other individuals can talk to me. Uh, and there's a gain trim. And then if I click on top of it, uh, I can say whether this is my microphone for whether I'm adopting it for my talkback mic. Uh, just turn on basic compression, soft or hard, and auto mix, etc. But beyond that, that is it. The, the, you know, there's automatic gain maybe happening in the background. Auto mix is happening. There's no fader. I just press on and hit record, and, and everything is really running. So drop a drop a microphone on, and you get one set of resources. Drop a bed on to play some music and you get a little audio player. So I can uh, fire that audio in or hit preview and when I'm hitting preview I can hit play and it, it plays to me through the through the preview in my headphones. So physically simple, operationally simple, but also operationally providing this idea of different utensils giving different information and control uh, which are then contextually uh, lined up with the different types of things that, that you might want to do. Uh, in a radio studio. Ah, okay, okay. So what are those different, so uh, the different kinds of things therefore that I have up there in my menu are all the things you might have in a radio studio. So I have four microphones, the, the four ones we've spoken about that are sitting on the table. Uh, right. The web mic, which we'll come back to at the end because that's our little little interesting COVID-related uh, kind of ability to, to 
have people, guests appear at the table, uh, a telephone. So if I drag that and drop that on to channel number two, then I have a different utensil. And of course, that has a, a pop-up dial pad, et cetera, that I can uh, use as a phone because it's not a microphone or a, or a player. I have the little green uh, icons there, which are live wire channels. So I can drop a live wire channel there onto slot number four. Uh, and if I press sources uh, down there, and let's uh, zoom out so you can see the whole thing, then in there I can type BBC, which will give me my, um, uh, my BBC sources on our Axia network. So all of the stuff that you would do normally to discover IP audio sources, etc., you can do very, very easily. Just press source, type in the name that you want, uh, click on it, and then if you click um, to, uh, to add that to the the resources that you use on your table setting, then it will appear in your menu. So we have, as you can see on here, hundreds and hundreds of live wire sources, but we don't have all of those available at any given time on the table. We can select which ones we think this table setting is going to use uh, and then add them into the menu so that we're not kind of swamped. Uh, and then same with the blue uh, blob at the end for, for a media file. You can just take um, an, a WAV file or an MP3 file or an audio file from your desktop drag it and drop it onto your browser. This is not an application, this is just all HTML5 in my web browser. And if you drop the audio file in there, it gets sent up to the cloud, onto the table, and then it becomes a menu item. You can just drag and drop and then play it straight in. So all wow. of the things you'd expect for a studio are sat there in the menu, ready for you to drag them, drop them onto your surface and device, which is controlling it. Uh, and then at that point, um, you can do everything that you would do as if this was a fully equipped, fully loaded radio studio, talk show system, uh, you know, codecs for outside sources, live wire sources, audio to play, uh, multiple microphones, remote guests, etc. But all you've got is your simple edge device and a, and a web browser. Wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm almost overloaded here. <laughs> and and I, I got to keep remembering that the, what you're holding in your hand, what you're showing on the screen is not the mixer itself. You're going to tell us about that later. We're almost up up to a, a, a break time here soon. Uh, I was really intrigued by the fact that I could take a uh, a, a, a wave file and just drop it uh, onto my browser, and it will end up importing over there. Is that right? Did I get that right? Correct. Yeah, so we needed a way of people getting resources onto the table. And because you're not touching the actual player, the player's sat down here, then you just take the file, drag it, drop it onto the browser at your end, and then it will be uploaded, and then it will just appear as one of those uh, yeah, blue uh, player items into the menu. So, you know, again, this is aimed primarily at the moment at people producing podcasts or short-form content, sort of, you know, not, not non-linear kind of content. So you can have stings, you're going to have beds, you can have promos, intros, outros, etc., uh, and they can just be, uh, yeah, um, oh, you've just put something up there, right? Newsday. I just put something up there. So if I drag and it, it's perf perf I perfectly playable. I've, there, I've paid there for it. it. Is. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we'll leave that there, and later on, when we actually let you guys hear what's on the table, we'll uh, we'll listen okay. to it. As long as that's clean and legal, and, then uh, then we'll play and that I, later. I did that from I did that from Nashville, Tennessee. I this is crazy. I added audio to essentially your show in England, and you could play it, or yeah, so, I so, could so, play so, it, but I just dragged it on. Oh my gosh. This is crazy. So we should we should explain to your to your yeah to, to the audience that that ahead of this time I, I've given Kirk the link to this table. So uh, Kirk yeah. can see on on a couple of devices in his studio in front of him that exactly the same thing that you're all seeing on the screen. This is all really live. What I'm controlling and doing on my iPad, uh, which is not you know which is which is hosted up in Azure, uh, is also viewed by Kirk. So he can see what I'm doing and he can also collaborate and in the control of that. So yes, all the information and all the control, you can have as many different people connected back to that. Physically, we have space for four headphones and four microphones here. That's not really a limit. It was just a philosophical construct that the, typically these kind of yeah, small spaces yeah. would have four mics and four headphones. Uh, yeah, but we, we, we are, you know, are both essentially seated at the table. Uh, and as you'll see later on, it, it gets way beyond that when it went, when we see what you can actually do and what we can do together, even though you're thousands of miles away. But yeah, you, you are an equal participant at the table just because you have a web browser on on your device there in Nashville. Um, we'll we'll get we're going to get a whole demo in in a few minutes. We're going to take a commercial break shortly. I, I, I've got what Dan has on. This is a Chromebook. This is literally a um, hundred and fifty nine dollar Chromebook right here. And uh, that seems to work just fine. I was playing with it earlier, and we have two-way audio. For, well, I'm sorry, I'll I'll keep quiet about that till Dan demonstrates it. And just to <laughs> just to prove this out, 
I have a Windows machine uh, to my right where I've got the same thing that Dan's looking at in a slightly different configuration because the, the screen is a different size and shape. And then I've also got uh, on from my Mac, I've got a tab from my Chrome browser on my Mac dragged over to a different screen and I have the same thing over there. So uh, Dan, this, uh, and if you do something on one screen, it is a couple of milliseconds that shows up on the other screen. It's amazing. So uh, I guess this means you can easily have remote participants doing this as well as people who are sitting at the table, right? Yeah, so this, you know, we're, we're, people are probably guessing where we're going with this. So, yeah, so the original premise of Table came out of this idea of a very simple physical studio space. We had already had the idea of what we called Picnic, which was the idea of being able to join the table uh, but not be in the same physical space using WebRTC mm. technology, which we already had uh, and we're using uh, as part of Anywhere, which is our kind of remote contribution codec. So we thought, well, you know, from the browser, you can now connect high quality audio and receive high quality audio using WebRTC. So we were going to allow people to appear as kind of occasional guests and contributors uh, using WebRTC because the browser essentially means, is this the edge device? Is the physical table uh, the low latency edge device that I'm using here? Or is this the edge device? Is the audio going into and out of my iPad uh, and actually you know, yes, right now it's both. This is an audio edge device, which we'll see in a minute, but also the low latency one is, is right here. So if I'm not yeah. at the table, I'm a guest, then I would be using WebRTC. And of course, what's happened over the last year with COVID has meant that this idea of, wait, is this a complete radio studio in the cloud with all of those capabilities? And, and you know, I could be here, you could be in Nashville, and we could do a show together seamlessly uh, has kind of come to dominate perhaps people's thinking about what table is because actually I don't need anyone seated at the table. I could be sat at my house with my iPad, you could be sat at your house with your iPad, and we could have three, four, five more people, and we could all play audio, record audio, bring in phone or guests, uh, you know, do everything that we would here, but actually without the table. So yeah, probably in, in the second half, as we look at what we're doing here, we'll also drill into that whole idea of full-on remote production, be that for podcasts or even for live, and all the capabilities that this gives us um, that take people beyond what people are using in Zoom and, and uh, those sorts of non-broadcast platforms, but for doing remote contribution and yeah, full-on remote production, you now have on your Chromebook, on your Mac, on your iPad, and all your devices there, a full broadcast studio capability, um, and that's pretty wild. Wow. My goodness. Okay, we're going to have the demo coming up. We're going to hear audio uh, get moved around <laughs> between where Dan is and someplace in the cloud with uh, Microsoft Azure uh, service up there and uh, here in Nashville, Tennessee, where we already tested this and it was pretty amazing. Hey, this week in Radio Tech, I'm Kirk Harnack in the Nashville studio of the TELUS Alliance, and it's episode 541 with Dan McQuillan talking about um, the bionic table. Oh, gosh. There's a uh, it's, uh, I, I'm not sure we can describe it with just those two words, bionic table. That, that in, encompasses quite a lot. Our show is brought to you in part by our friends at Angry Audio, angryaudio.com, where you can find, yeah, but I'm just so excited about these products. This is, this is the headphone amp that bolts up under the table. And if you want, you know, some plenty of volume for your, your people around the table, you got some, there's some old disc jockeys who blow their hearing out with crown d75 amplifier years ago well this is the this is what you want this will give you plenty of volume it has both sides uh, sizes of headphone connector quarter inch and eighth inch and you know my favorite thing is that it's got this nice curved shape to it so if you run your uh, your 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 uh, uh chair up under the table you're not going to hurt yourself you won't snag your pantyhose as i often say the other thing that angry audio has is they are now the manufacturer the whole owner of studio hub and if you're going to be wiring up a an x node like what dan has in his studio right there they've looked, looked at a few times you're going to want some of the studio hub adapters whether it's this kind of adapter where you uh, you plug your rj45 cable in here you run that over to the back of your x node and you come out with whatever kind of uh, connectors that you need uh you can do it that way or you can um get with the XLR connectors. And we also have the connectors, uh, the adapter cables that come out to a male RJ45. So no matter how you want to wire your studio up, this stuff from Studio Hub makes it so easy to do that you're going to, you're just going to want to do this. There's no point in, um, uh, in wiring your own stuff anymore where you can buy these adapters, click, 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 
and put things together, and it's just really, really easy. Angry Audio, the website is angryaudio.com. And yeah, the headline studio hub is back. It's been back. It's made in the same factory, the same jigs, and the, and the same uh, injection molding, everything that Studio Hub is famous for. So please check that out. And the website, angryaudio.com. And hey, you may see some, some knockoff adapters. They aren't Studio Hub quality. And I tell you what, Studio Hub is no more expensive than that, that other stuff. So check it out and ask for Studio Hub by name. Hey, our show is also brought to you in part by our friends at Max Connect Wireless. We're going to hear real quick a quick testimonial. Be right back. With all of the recent cybersecurity attacks against large corporations, we were looking for a product that would give us the ultimate security at our transmitter sites and as well as with our broadcast equipment. Max Connect fits the bill very well. Its greatest security feature is the fact that it gives you a single static IP address. Using this single static IP address allows us to close hundreds of open ports on our firewalls across the company and restrict access to only the Max Connect IPs. This has greatly reduced our exposure to the World Wide Web and made us much more secure moving forward. It has also given us the ability to expand as needed in a secure fashion. Security and convenience and, um, gee, uh, connectivity, even when you're in a crowd of people. And I realize we've been in COVID times, not many crowds. You know, things are coming back. I was actually at a baseball game last night, a kid's baseball game, and there was a crowd there. Oh, my goodness. Here in Nashville, Tennessee, there was a crowd, and people were on their cell phones. And if I was doing a live broadcast from there, I wasn't. But if I was, I would definitely be using Max Connect Wireless because I would have my data throughput right there. Math Connect Wireless. Okay. Uh, all right. We're back here with Dan McQuillan. And uh, Dan, I guess we're getting ready for this demo of uh, the Bionic table. What can we see? Yeah. So uh, so I'm sat here at my, uh, at my table and I've got my microphone there that you can see and we've got the audio that you uploaded. Uh, and I, so I've tra dragged stuff from the menu and I've dropped it onto the table. And we've got this idea of utensils, so let's just drag a, a BBC audio source on there as well. So that's, a, that's just a, a network live wire audio source uh, here. So uh, what does that look like in practice? If, if we look at the top then of the, of the control area of this, if I just play in that network audio source, you'll start to see that little level meter bounce around. And if I just tweak that little game trim up and down, you'll see that if, we, if I make it too loud, it goes red, which means it's too loud or too hot. Uh, and if I take the gain down, it will go through green, which is the kind of correct level down to blue and then go off. And if I bring it back to the right level, it's green. So we want to create very, very simple information and control. If it's green, your levels are right. Uh, if it's red, you're too hot. If it's blue, you're too cold. And indeed, with auto level and auto mix, we can pretty well make sure that that's all happening kind of automatically. Um, so in here, I just uh, drag, you know, a couple of different microphones on. So let's drag, you know, three microphones on and turn those on. Uh, and then I start playing the, the audio that, that Kirk uh, has sent up to us. Uh, and what I can do here is just press record, right? So as I'm pressing record now, everything that happens on the table is being recorded. Again, not into this device. It's being recorded into the virtual machine that I'm sat on top of in the, uh, in the data center underneath. Uh, I can control my headphone level, et cetera. Uh, far in your little uh, clip there again, turn different microphones on and off, play that other source in for a couple of seconds so we have that audio there. And then when I stop recording, uh, I've got that 24 seconds of audio uh, underneath me here. And when I press downloads, uh, I can then see uh, in the screen there, the, the uh, so 22nd of April at 22.38, we recorded 24 seconds, and it lists the sources that we use. So we use the live wire source of BBC Radio 1 and three microphones. Uh, and I can hit play on there and instantly hear the preview of that back. I can hit stereo, and then if I hit stereo, I can just download the 24 seconds of audio with all that stuff mixed together. But even cooler than that, if I press multi-track, then I can download uh, the, the multi -track. You're full screen, so your your mic went away. So I've downloaded that to my device, and yeah. now I have an Adobe uh, Cezex uh, with all of the tracks laid out. So this table is not just a media player. Uh, this table is not just a talk show system. This table is, you know, it's also a, a full multi-track recording setup uh, that you might expect to have from your big studio, but you certainly wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to do that. So I can run into here. Uh, just grab, you know, grab four microphones, uh, drop them onto the table, press on, hit record, record our element, 
uh, drop in a drop in a bed or some sort of intros and outros, bring a guest in on the phone, uh, hit record at the end to stop, and then immediately put that into a craft editor, clean everything up from the ISOs, uh, and you know the, the base mix is already there, ready to go. And again, that recording is not on this device. So when I walk away, yeah. I can go to the web browser and bring that recording back from anywhere. So you, you could download that multi-track into Nashville right now um, and, and bring it up and editor at your end. So so this is you, you know, you uh, the controls of a table. Huh? Sorry, Kurt. You have just blown my mind again. And I know that your company has done this before because I, I, I saw your early demonstrations and your web, your uh, NAB demonstrations. But not only did you record the stereo recording of that, but very importantly, you recorded each each element that was in there separately, and it's available on a multi-track. So if it needs to be fixed, if the stereo sum wasn't good enough to play like on social media over and over and over again by you know a hundred thousand people uh, you have the opportunity to fix that in the multi-track and then publish it out there so you you record it both ways at the same time don't you yeah wow. and and you know there are lots of different reasons sometimes people want to do a craft edit before they because typically this would be used for a podcast so you have that opportunity to tweak uh, but you get the basics oh, yeah. are all there so you just have to tweak you don't have to start again uh, or you might just want to lift certain isolated tracks out because there was a great quote that, that Kirk said during the interview, and you want to lift that out from the ISO as well. So, yeah, without even without other no ISO yeah, without is, other or, noise or, or, or music bed, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just does that, and we did produce some tech for doing that for all kind of live wire consoles several years ago called More or the Multi Object Recorder. But to be honest, the hardest yeah. mind part of that was getting people to understand that they could just add that into their big monolithic radio studio, most of which don't actually do what I just showed you this, this simple physical table doing. Uh, but we just thought, well, if we bake it in, then people will just realize that that's there. And in particular, in this recording-based workflow for podcasts, it just makes a lot of sense that you walk up to the table, drop four microphones on, hit on, 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 hit record, and yeah, all the ISO's done, uh, you know, and, and yeah, you, you've got a, a stereo recorder, multi-track recorder, talk show system, playout system, uh, all running inside a yeah, $150 Chromebook. Now, while you were demonstrating that, I was actually, I, I didn't know if you were going to supply the audio to, to the, this webcast, or I, I thought I could just listen remotely like I did earlier today. And then I realized, no, I can't because I'm, I here in Nashville am not actually yet from an audio point of view. I'm not part of your broadcast yet because that would be a separate web based uh, mic function. Um, uh, if, if you want to talk about that now, yeah, great. So if, so you, if you've got that. Yeah, so if you, if you look at that menu at the top, you'll see there's one item we haven't used, which is the orange one. So I'm going to drag the orange one down to, to utensil five. And why don't you go ahead and prove that any idiot can operate this uh, and put your own <laughs> web mic on, uh, on channel six. Uh, I'll click on the web mic there for me and just delete that there and say that I am then going to be Dan iPad uh, on there. And I'll put preview on, which we'll see what that means uh, kind of in a moment. So then down the bottom left, you'll see two orange yep. blocks. The left one of those is me, mm -hmm. the right one is Kirk. I'm going to go ahead and hit connect on the left one. If you hit connect on the right one, what I've now done is taken my iPad and connected using uh, WebRTC uh, my iPad into the table. So now, uh, and this is going to get confusing because I'm at the table and I have this here. Yeah, already, my yeah. edge device yeah. no longer yeah. needs to be this low latency microphone. Uh, I can talk into my uh, microphone on my uh, iPad. Oh, um, I'm and hearing then you. As I speak into here, you can you can hear it coming out of Kirk's. Um, speaker which is on and he's on another web mic and more about that in a minute at his end but you'll also see it coming out on the on the audio level uh on, on my little meter there probably needs to turn that up a little bit um so we've now said okay we can have a table which has low super low latency between the microphone and the headphones and four people sharing the same physical space but i can bring a single guest in which is myself in the first instance and then i could get really confusing and turn my microphone on here and then talk to myself and it will come uh, back out. Okay, so now right. this is going to be where it. it's going to get very confusing. Um, the audio from my iPad is not coming out of my iPad right now because my iPad is using AirPlay to connect to an Apple TV over there, which is connected to a Blackmagic web presenter, which is going over USB into my vMix machine here. Okay, pay attention. So uh, this iPad you can hear when I bring audio on. So to prove that, uh, if I press on on BBC Radio 1, you will now start to hear a little bit of latency because at the moment, 
at the moment there's some latency there because I have to press on on here, it goes up to the cloud, comes down, it turns on Radio right. 1, Radio 1 then comes very quickly up to here, but then it goes from here over airplay to there, goes down to there and comes back out. But trust me, uh, when, when you do it from your end, you'll see that when you press it, almost immediately you hear that audio and you can control the level. So I now have taken this device and made it, instead of being just part of the control of the local table, anywhere on earth, this device is a full participant. I'm going to turn my microphone off because I'm hearing myself back through Kirk. Yeah, um, yeah, I hear you. Th th this device is the microphone and the headphones uh, for the Edge device. Now, it gets even cooler than that. So uh, I, when I clicked on here, chose whether I wanted preview to arrive on my device. So now I'm like a web mm -hmm. producer as well as a web contributor. So if I hit preview on that audio that, that you uploaded earlier and hit play, now, even though that isn't on the table, uh, then that will start to... Why did you send me something with a quiet intro? Uh, then, uh, let me turn that up a little bit on, on there. Um, so play that louder this time around. Um, so that audio is audio that started in Nashville, is being played by clicking on my iPad, is then being previewed by, by me playing it in the little mini player on here, is then being sent back over WebRTC to this device, which is controlling it, uh, and then from there it's coming out to you guys. So I can sit on my device, preview and listen to stuff, tweak uh, levels on it, and what we've, we've added very recently is I can do talk back. So I can hit talk on the web mic for Kirk, and now when I speak mm -hmm. in here, even though I'm not on air, my voice is then coming out in Nashville, uh, and yes, likewise Kirk could talk back to me, for what you say, because when you say it, that will actually go through my iPad and background to your to your audience. So um, if, if, if I talk to you this way, are you hearing me? Yep, you sure are hearing me. I, I can yep, hear myself sure back. I, yep. I can hear myself. How about that? Yeah. Um, and that's full duplex. So if you both hit talk, we can talk to each other. And if you saw when Kirk was talking to me, it lights up down the bottom to say that Kirk is talking. Uh, and if I don't want him to be talking, I can just tap, tap that and, and cancel off him. Uh, you know, if I'm like, oh, not, not right now. Thank you. So not only do we have the ability to have remote guests uh, and remote contributors, but we can now have somebody actually produce and, and you know, we, we don't need anybody at the table because we can preview and listen to audio. We can set levels. We can view the, view the meters start the record, stop the record, download the stereo and the multitrack, all from Nashville or from Hayward Teeth or from London or simultaneously from every continent on Earth. And all you need at the edge is the, is the web browser device talking to that table.host, which, which uh, is a domain that, that Bionics has bought and, and uses as your mm -hmm. just, to, just to host. And that has a very simple, secure set of protocols which are only transforming web, transferring web-friendly data between that as your host and what we call the agent, which is what's running underneath here in the building. So that, that, you ah. know, that, that IP link is fixed. So there's, there's no open sockets or ports kind of here for, for any, anybody mm. to connect into. We are simply connecting a web browser up to an Azure web application. And then that has a you know, fixed IP link from there down to the, down to the agent underneath. So it's very secure. And the audio, you'll not be surprised, is, is coming through WebRTC. So because we have that single secure central point running HTTPS, that acts as this sort of invitation and coordination point for WebRTC. And actually then your audio to and from Nashville is redirected by that to go from the server here straight to you over, over WebRTC. So really high quality, really low latency audio. Uh, but all of that kind of centralized information and control means that we all can see this very, very quickly and collaborate and control on updating text and names and, and you know, hitting fire and things happen really, really swiftly. So um, uh, I'm, I'm going to have, I'm gonna have creative a, control is important. I'm going to have a question or two, but I've, I'm just itching to push a button here and make something happen there. Can I push that, that piece of audio uh, I, I uploaded? Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Go for it, yeah. Oops. I, I got to turn oh, it up way too high. Down. Sorry, Sorry. Up earlier. <laughs> Sorry about the levels, folks. That was my, my fault. I had it cranked up way too, uh, <laughs> way, way too high here. And you had yours cranked up kind of high, too. And for, if I wanted to play this I BBC did. radio, how about that? Better not play much of that for, you know, EMCA. Um, <laughs> Just, yeah, but, so, so, I, but that, I'm, so that I'm is BBC Radio from a tuner downstairs, uh, then coming yeah. across Livewire. So it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a software tuner with a sound card, which is why the quality of that isn't great, because it's just off, off the air, received over FM into this building, encoded into Livewire. And we just chose that as a random uh, you know, Livewire stream on, on the network here. So that's a Livewire sure. stream in this building that you have access to in Nashville now. So we actually now are using this for testing because of COVID, we don't have many people in the office. So we connect into table, and when we want to then check something in the building, we just we can just dial up any live wire streams in the building and, and preview them or move them about and listen to them. So 
kind of a, kind of a cute way of extending live wire to, to you know, anywhere on earth. Now you may have already said, but I want to be real clear. Uh, so I, I'm, when I'm pushing buttons on here, the actual mixing of these different things, the actual routing and mixing of, of uh, my, my voice, me hearing you for, through uh, talk back, um, the, the, the BBC audio we've brought in and brought out the piece of music that I played that mixing is going on, on an, an Axia product called IQS, which is a software based mixing engine. And that's located where. That's uh, directly underneath me here, and it's not a physical okay. product. That's a software, yeah, a virtual machine. So there is a Dell right. server sitting underneath here, uh, and that's a 32-core Dell server, but we have a very small number of those cores which are, which are being used for, for the table. So there's a right. single Linux uh, instance running the IQS as a software mixer virtually, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a Windows instance which is running the audio engine, which is providing the player and doing the network discovery. So, uh, yeah, let's fire up a little diagram here, hopefully. Uh, oh, oh okay. I, I disappeared on that. Okay. Um, interesting. So uh, this is how it all actually works, right? So on the left-hand side, you can see what's next to me, the physical table. And there really is nothing on the table except for this little, you know, this little small uh, edge device that, as I said earlier, right. it looks disappointingly like a 1980s car stereo. Uh, but <laughs> we wanted to mount it in here for the, for the NAB, uh, but that is just an Axia X node just mounted into the table to just to reveal what, you know, because we don't want anyone to kind of think that we're pretending it's magic. That That's just the Axia X node there. So on that diagram right. there, you'll see on the left a table with an X node PoE into the audio network. Um, and then you'll see that we have a couple of things uh, in the um, in the building. So we have a thing we call table agent. And the table agent is the thing which is actually doing the local security. It's doing the network discovery of resources. It's communicating with all of the kind of local resources. So you would have one of those kind of table agents running in the building. You would also then have the virtual mixer, which is the IQS. So um, each table right now uses a single instance of, of an OEM version of, of IQS, which is a little bit stripped back from the kind of full version because we don't need all of the capabilities uh, of the IQS. Uh, and we have uh, two other services running on the Windows uh, VM downstairs, one called table.audio, which is actually providing the, the, the phone hybrid, uh, you know, the software phone hybrid, the software WebRTC, and the, and the ability to play out those stings and beds and audio, et cetera. So those mm -hmm. three VMs, are the scalable part of this. So in that machine, we can spin up and spin down any number of those virtual resources to fulfill the needs of, of the number of concurrent tables. So each table is a very physically simple resource. It's just the node on the edge and the devices. So you could have tens or hundreds of these. Every meeting room could be a Bionic table. The corner of every right. office, which is where I'm sat, could have a little virtual table in it, a Bionic table in it. But then that, that centralized software uh, system fully virtualized, you can spin up and down as many resources as you need for the number of simultaneous tables that are operating in, inside that facility. Uh, or they could be fully web hosted if you, didn't have, if you didn't have the low latency part that we have here of these local microphones, all of that could live in Azure. But because, because we have this low latency need here, right. we've, we've got those running, running locally in this building. So there's one table.agent, and there's then N of those mixers, audio and record, sessions which operate depending on the number of active tables, but we can orchestrate those up and down dynamically as, as required, and we don't need one for every table. So as we have more than one table, I can create the settings on my table for, for my particular podcast, uh, and we can use this table today, and then when I run tomorrow to that table on the other end of the office, I can simply upload that table setting, the, the way we dress the table, the audio I had uploaded, the previous recordings, the settings we like about EQ and compression, all that stuff, simply appear in that space. Because remember, that other space is also just four microphones and four headphones, so it's the same as this one. So you can have any number of tables, share resources, and share sessions and settings uh, between them. And then the real extra bit of magic comes in that table host. So in this diagram, you can see the table host right at the top, which is the public cloud-based one, which is table.host that we host. And there's one in the building, which is the private one inside this network. So if you don't want to use WebRTC and you don't want anything at all outside, you can host that internally and just have it on your private network and your local LAN. Uh, or you can then create a second host uh, and, and direct it to both. Uh, and have your own one hosted in the cloud, or you can connect that external host to our secure Azure host, 
and then connect through that, which is how we're doing that today. So uh, Kirk's been given the link to, to this table uh, and a password, and, and then any number of devices can connect to that host right at the top. And if you look, all there is going from that host to the agent and that mixer and that table.cord, et cetera, is a very, very thin you know, WebSocket protocol that's very secure. It's nailed down to that IP address. You know, you can't hack it. You can't get anyone else to do anything over it. All, all we have online up there is that is that web application providing the physical surface that, that you're seeing. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, WebRTC is the audio. WebSockets used for just the data traffic to that to that host, which is what we've hosted in Azure. If you wish, you don't have to have that green stripe across the top, which is the public internet. You could do it all internally. But right. Even then, we can split between the audio network, which is where your low latency live wires are all living, and your office network, which you might have your Wi-Fi and your devices on. And again, only on, only, on the, only on the network of the office do you have just the information and control through this very thin web client. All of the actual low latency audio multicast stuff, that stays on your Axio, stays on your live wire network. Um, you know, all we have here is just the information and control, either through the local table.host to keep you secure and private in the building, or you can connect simultaneously or, or just, just singularly, if you like, to, to the publicly hosted table.host and then have people join you from, from literally from anywhere. So from an IT perspective, this sounds uh, like it's well laid out, well, it's well secured. The, the, the local AOIP network uh, is just like it would be in, in, in a regular broadcast facility. It, it, it's on its own. It's, it's local. Uh, people hear low latency things within the building. And when there's somebody participating from outside the building, uh, the, the latency is just, the, just like what you and I are talking now, actually less than that because we're kind of taking some extra hops here. Um, uh, so that, that I'm impressed with the, the web mic functionality i hear everything i'm supposed to hear but not myself so i hear a mix minus and my voice gets to you what's the on the on web rtc you've been able to make sure that the audio quality is as high as well as broadcasters expect can you talk about that for just a minute before we have to break again yeah so with web rtc we can make various settings about how we prioritize uh you know the packets and also how we uh you know fail in the event that, that we have loss and in particular at the moment where we're just doing audio so the next time we speak, we're, we're adding video into this, so, so you would be able to then have the video element of this conversation also coming via the table, because during COVID, people are beginning to use Zoom and other platforms for either coordination of seeing each other and gesturing and kind of, you know, having that extra kind of engagement, but also to, to, for camera switching, which this system can also do, um, uh, to, to then have them as contribution video feeds. But in particular there, WebRTC has the great ability to prioritize the audio over the video so we can downsample yeah. the, the video uh, or go down to a lower frame rate but keep, keep the audio, you know, crucially kind of, oh. which is, which is the, the main thing that, that, that we want to be using. Gotcha. Understood. And I see that in, in you know, in uh, video meetings online. So, you know, if somebody's internet gets bad, the, the video gets bad first before their audio gets, gets bad. So that, that's, that's good. Dan, wow, I'm almost overloaded. We're going to take a quick uh, break from our sponsor, uh, Vox Pro, and we'll be right back with a final word, final advice, uh, whatever you'd like to fill up the last couple of minutes with. We'll be right back after this word from Vox Pro and Broadcasters General Store. Hey, what's happening? St. John here coming to you from Command Central and wanted to tell you about the absolute best partner you can have in radio. I'm talking about, boom, Wheatstone's Vox Pro. Now, a lot of folks have used uh, previous versions of Vox Pro, all awesome, but I want to tell you about some of my favorite new features in 7. And for folks who've never used Vox Pro before, I'm about to tell you why it's an absolute game changer and essential for really fast-paced multi-element radio. Lots of different audio software out there. Why Vox Pro? Uh, cause duh, it was designed for radio. It's the only software designed to do what we needed to do, which is record, edit, playback in real time. When I say lightning fast, I'm going to show you how fast you can edit stuff up in Vox Pro right now. Literally three clicks on the controller, mark left, mark right, everything that gets marked, you hit delete, it goes away. It's literally that fast. So we're going to take this part right here. Boy, Turn on. Boom. From caller nine to him saying, I'm ready. Well, five, ready for that secret sound. Boom. All of that stuff, hit delete, it goes away. Here's your edit. You are tackling secret sound, caller nine. I'm ready, St. John. So one of the best features of version 7, this is awesome, it's effects macros and you can literally put a chain of effects together so that instead of uh, having to normalize a phone bit and then uh, use noise reduction on it and EQ it and all that, you can literally build a chain. One button, this button, this one's called call right here, I just click that, 
All of those processes happen instantaneously. Literally saves 80% of your editing and cleanup time. Final thing that I love about Vox Pro, and there's so much more to get into, but uh, one of my favorite things, you can load it on a laptop. I've literally done my show from a hotel room in Armenia to uh, the conference room at, yeah, this was fun, jury duty. Great thing. No one could tell the difference. Vox Pro makes it totally easy. Telling you, if you're looking for the best on-air partner, call my friends at Wheatstone, ask them about Vox Pro, and you'll be glad you did. And the place to get Vox Pro is actually to call Broadcasters General Store. You go to their website at bgs.cc or call them at 352-622-7700. I've been dialing that phone number for years. So I bought a lot of stuff from Broadcasters General Store. Check them out at bgs.cc. And that's where you can get your Vox Pro. All right. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack uh, in the Nashville studio at uh, uh, the This Week in Radio Tech, uh, our TELUS Alliance studio. And we're talking to Dan McQuillan, just about to, unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Dan, we've got maybe five or six minutes left. Uh, what would you like to talk about for our remaining time? Uh, so I guess we've talked a lot about the sort of, yeah, the nerdy stuff here. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, but for us, it's just as important because the philosophy of this and the direction of, you know, why are we doing this? Why do we think this is important? I think this is a wonderful creative time for, for radio to consider uh, how we build these flexible production spaces, how we deal with the, the increasing demands for additional content. That doesn't mean we need more and more of the big monolithic studios. We can be very flexible, very creative about how we uh, build spaces, inhabit those spaces. And really, I think we're going to see a, an incredibly exciting a uh, couple of years coming up as things like IQS, which is a brilliant little utility mixer. You know, this is not a mixer. If you, if you want to have a console or a mixer that you're using and manually doing the mix, then there are fantastic and exciting products from, from Telos uh, and others you know, inhabiting that space. But what we tend to do at Bionics is take those ideas and say, well, if you can do that, then actually if you think about how you package that, how you, how you operate that and build that into a workflow, I think there's some really exciting stuff coming that will allow us to build spaces that, that do look more like cushions and daylight or look like a table. And, you know, when I fold all this away and in a second when I turn the lights out and go home, there, there really is a very, very small footprint here that means we can uh, have a large number of these available in a whole range of spaces. This is not how, you know, my mother would make a podcast at home. She's going to use her iPad or a roadcaster or something really simple. But if you already have some broadcast facilities, if you have audio over IP, if you have an enterprise kind of uh, capability, or you want to do stuff remotely, uh, or you're a media partner, but maybe not a traditional radio station, a newspaper or a, a TV station, etc. then adding some of these around a, a big facility, the fact they're networked together, the leveraging what we can do already with multicast and live wire. I think we, we're living in an exciting time for content creation, for the platforms that we get to, to share that content on, uh, and also then actually for how we as technologists and people who, who love storytelling, we can get to build some really cool spaces but then democratize them to entirely new forms of content and, and different talent and different abilities uh, that I think will mean that we can keep radio relevant, keep telling fantastic stories, keep generating that amazing original content, uh, whether we're feeding the hungry transmitter or, or creating dozens of podcast strands, audio is definitely here to stay. Uh, and you know, if we can take and apply the skills and technology that we've had from the past, the capabilities that are coming on stream now, and some of these perhaps more creative ways of building workflows out of it, I think, yeah, the best for our industry and for the stuff we get to do is, is definitely yet to come. You know, in, in terms of people who I meet who are talent, uh, some talent are perfectly capable of, of operating big consoles and they, they, they understand the flow and they understand what a program bus is and that kind of thing. But I also meet talent that doesn't know that stuff, doesn't want to know that stuff. They just want to sit down or stand up and do their show. They want to talk to people. They want to play fun audio. They want to play meaningful audio and create meaningful programming. And it looks like a tool like this is really what they want to get the technology to disappear that complexity and that technology so they can just focus on what they want to create. Is that fair? Yes, and, and so there are you know, different philosophies here of yeah, flexible spaces to make it nice for the station to, to not have to build complex spaces. But yeah, they actually, right. this is really what I think talent wants. You know, they, they, they've had to learn technology because they had to, because the way you operated it was very manual. You were part of the machine. The machine can now be intelligent and helpful and dynamic, and then therefore the technology disappears and is simply there as an aid 
uh, and assistance and, and you can rock up without needing to know about luffs and decibels and, and you know, all those kind of things. You just say, I would like four microphones, turn them on, we're all going to talk and it's going to sound fabulous. Um, and then, yeah, I think it changes, hopefully democratizes the, the access to that as well as empowering the, you know, talent that does know, uh, you know what they're doing. Uh, I think you will still see traditional studio spaces used for, for the big flagship breakfast shows and, and you know, full live spaces. Absolutely, you know, they, they are complex spaces that, that, that deliver very complex and challenging output. But very often we don't need all of those resources uh, or we don't have access to, to skilled operators you know, who, who know how to use them. And for that, I think we're going to see yeah, some really interesting new uh, forms of production space. And hopefully along with that, uh, here's some interesting stories and voices that are enabled by, by opening this up to, to a wider number of people. Dan, as usual, you've kind of blown my mind over and over again, expanded uh, imagination. And uh, I'm, I know people will be cogitating on what you've said here. A lot of questions, I'm sure. If, if people do have questions, is, this product isn't really on your website yet, is it? Or is it? No. So, yeah, we should have explained that right now we have two uh, kind of customers or trials which are kind of operating with this. So with the BBC, mm -hmm. we've mentioned who were kind of probably the part of the genesis of the idea of Digital Table and certainly we've worked most closely with. So they have uh, a fully hosted version like this uh, that we're using because they don't have anybody really in a lot of their studio facilities from an engineering and a kind of test perspective. So we were supposed to have two physical versions of this table with them in New Broadcasting House. Instead, they are actually uh, they are, uh, they're testing it in a purely virtual online mm. you know, form only. Uh, but then our friends at Southern Cross Austereo, with Australia having taken a, you know, a quite a different path with COVID, uh, they still have physical human beings in their physical studios and offices. So they have our first two physical tables being tested with them. So yeah, this is currently, it's way beyond a, a prototype and a thought experiment. It, it is real, yeah. it does work, uh, and it is being used in test. But yeah, it's being piloted uh, by the BBC in the virtual and the online hosted form only, and with Southern Cross Australia in the physical form. And we're doing that with engineering staff with them, with producers and presenters saying, you know, do you, how do you get on without having faders and, and you know, so everything is being shaken in terms of how it looks, uh, what, what the physical metaphors look like on the screen. So we're in that sort of testing phase. And, you know, so if, if anyone else wants to get involved in that, they can certainly contact us. But this, this will be a product in, in about two to three months from now. So oh, okay. about so three months of this yeah. kind of current testing phase. Certainly before, uh, by uh, the NAB show that's coming up in, when is it, October? Or is it September? September? In October. And so we, we, we October. still, uh, October, so we still plan to be at that. You know, we, we don't mm -hmm. know if we'll be allowed to travel or if the show will still go on, but we certainly hope that it will. And I hope I will be there, and I hope that this, this physical table that should have been in Vegas by now uh, will be shipped out. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have the table there for sure for people to look at that, as well as all of our kind of traditional products and all the other stuff uh, that we're up to. We'll, we'll look for more updates, and, and uh, um, I may just come to Vegas myself to do a torch show from there and talk to people like you and, and other, other innovators in, in our space. So, Dan, it's, it's a pleasure. I, I wish we had three hours to talk. As I think we could, we could fill it all up with, uh, with, with demonstrations and technology. But thank you for thinking uh, so far ahead and giving, uh, you know, helping us all to think bigger and differently about what we do as engineers and as people who provide uh, the tools that broadcasters need. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and thank you for sharing it with your audience. And if your audience want to make comments or reach out to Kurt, yeah, we, this, we're very much looking to listen and learn from people's reaction to the idea. Uh, you know, we're very hard to offend. So yeah, let's, let's start a conversation and that would be fantastic. So thank you what, for what you're doing, for keeping our industry thinking, for sharing that knowledge and for, you know, helping us all to connect together. It's been a tough year for everybody. Uh, and I think, you know, opportunities like this to, to, to connect together, to share thoughts and ideas are valued yeah, more than ever. So thanks. The, the, uh, the web link that's mentioned in your ads is bionic.radio. Is that, is that a good place to uh, check up on you guys and uh, hit a contact us button or something? Yeah, that's the website. So you can see all the other stuff that we're kind of yeah, known for. The talk show and, and social media stuff is, uh, is all up there. Uh, but uh, yeah, you won't find table up there, although we might start sharing. It's a little bit more public than it was a few months ago. So you might, we might start to share some, some videos. Uh, but, you know, Kirk, I think you are probably the first fully public time we've demonstrated this. So oh, wow. uh, I'm, I'm well. pretty happy to start that with you anyway. <laughs> cool. Good deal. Dan McQuillan, uh, he is the managing director at Broadcast Bionics.
And I don't know if he's been uh, knighted yet in England, but uh, I'm I'm sure that's coming along pretty soon. Dan, thank you for being with us. I really appreciate it. Just give uh, give my uh, give my love to Duncan and everybody else uh, up there at Bionics. Okay. Thanks, and stay safe. Okay. All right. Suncast, thank you very much for producing uh, This Week in Radio Tech. We produce, uh, we uh, appreciate all of your fine button pushing and making everything work. Thanks and also to Andrew Zarian. Uh, he is the, uh, well, the executive director. He's the founder of the GFQ Network, home of lots of fine podcasts. So what's coming up next week? I'm not sure. We're going to figure it out. And in a couple of weeks, uh, I think we may be doing the show live from one of the Grammy museums. We're trying to get permission right now, working on that. Uh, you know, the radio is a big part of, uh, of, of the music industry and what makes the Grammy Awards happen. So we're working on that. And uh, we got lots of good stuff coming up in the next few weeks for you. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.